the hum of the fridge, the gentle flicker of the TV screen. Those were the sounds of a normal Tuesday night. Elena was curled up on the couch, lost in a book, and I was tinkering with a broken radio in the kitchen. It was a quiet, ordinary evening, the kind I'd come to appreciate after years of living in the city. Out here, in our little town, things moved at a slower pace. Then the lights went out. Damn it, I muttered, more annoyed than concerned. Power outages weren't uncommon out here. We were surrounded by thick woods, and a strong wind was enough to bring down a branch and knock out the lines. I glanced over at Elena, who looked up from her book, a question in her eyes. Just a power outage, I said, getting up from my chair. Probably a tree down somewhere. I'll check the breakers. The breaker box was in the basement, a dimly lit space that always felt a little colder than the rest of the house. I flipped the switch, hoping for the reassuring thump of the system resetting. Nothing. That's odd, I muttered to myself. I checked the main breaker, still nothing. I headed back upstairs, a knot of unease starting to form in my stomach. What's wrong? Elena asked, her voice a little tight. It's not the breakers, I said. Must be something at the substation. I'm going to drive over and check it out. Might be a while. She nodded, the worry evident in her eyes. Be careful, it's pretty dark out there. I grabbed my flashlight and headed out to the truck. As I pulled out of the driveway, I noticed that the streetlights were all out. The houses were dark, windows glowing faintly with the flickering light of candles. An unnatural silence hung in the air, broken only by the wind rustling the leaves in the trees. I'd seen power outages before, but this felt different. There was a tension in the air, a prickling at the back of my neck that I couldn't shake off. It was as if the darkness itself had taken on a life of its own, a presence that pressed down on the town, a silent, watchful entity. I reached the substation, a small brick building on the outskirts of town. I parked the truck, grabbed my tools, and headed inside. The equipment hummed quietly, the usual indicator lights blinking a reassuring green. Everything seemed to be in working order, but there was no power. I ran through the diagnostics, checking every connection, every switch, my mind racing. Nothing made sense. The equipment was fine, but the power was gone. It was as if something was draining the energy, something I couldn't see or understand. I stood there in the dimly lit room, the hum of the inactive equipment a low, unsettling drone, and a cold certainty crept over me. This wasn't a normal power outage. This was something else, something far more sinister, something that had awakened in the darkness, something that was watching me, waiting. The substation was quiet, the silence amplifying the hum of the inactive equipment. I ran a hand over the transformer, the metal cool beneath my touch. It should have been vibrating, humming with energy, but it felt dead, inert. I double-checked the connections, the readings, every damn thing I could think of. Everything looked normal, but the power was gone. It was like something had sucked the life out of the system, leaving behind a hollow shell. I stepped outside, the night air cool and damp against my skin. The sky was clear, the stars bright pinpricks against the black canvas, but they offered no comfort. The darkness felt different out here, heavier, more oppressive. It was as if it was pressing in on me, suffocating me. I heard a car pull up behind me, the headlights cutting through the darkness. It was Frank, my neighbor, his old Ford pickup rattling to a stop beside my truck. Frank was in his late seventies, a widower who lived alone in a rambling old farmhouse on the edge of town. He'd been born and raised here, knew the town's history better than anyone. What's going on, Lucas? He asked, stepping out of his truck. His voice was raspy, a lifetime of cigarettes and hard living etched into its tone. Power's out, I said, gesturing towards the dark substation. Whole town's blacked out. Can't figure out what's causing it. Everything looks fine, but there's no juice. Frank nodded slowly, his eyes scanning the dark woods that bordered the substation. 
Maybe it's not meant to be fixed, Lucas. I frowned, confused. What do you mean? He hesitated, then glanced over his shoulder as if he was afraid someone might be listening. There are things in this town, things most folks don't know about, things that like the dark. I'd always known Frank was a bit eccentric, a lover of local lore and ghost stories. But there was something in his eyes, a seriousness I hadn't seen before that made me pay attention. What kind of things? I asked, my voice lower than intended. He shook his head, his gaze returning to the woods. Old things, Lucas. Things best left undisturbed. He turned and walked back to his truck, his words hanging in the air like a warning. I watched him drive away, his taillights disappearing into the darkness, a strange, unsettling feeling crawling up my spine. I returned to the substation, the hum of the inactive equipment now a menacing drone. Frank's words echoed in my mind, his warning stirring up a fear I couldn't rationalize. I'd always been a practical guy, a man of logic and reason, but out here in the suffocating darkness, my certainty wavered. I tried the systems again, flipping switches, checking connections, hoping for a flicker of life, a sign that I could restore order, bring back the light. But the darkness held firm, a silent, suffocating presence that seemed to mock my efforts. As I drove back into town, the full extent of the blackout became apparent. Every house was dark, the streets eerily quiet. Small groups of people huddled together on porches and sidewalks, their faces illuminated by the flickering glow of flashlights and candles. There was a tension in the air, a sense of unease that seemed to amplify with each passing moment. I stopped at the town hall, where a crowd had gathered. The mayor, a flustered man named Terence Quill, was trying to reassure everyone, but his words were lost in the murmuring of worried voices. What's happening, Lucas? he asked, his face pale in the dim light. Any idea when the power's coming back on? I shook my head. I checked the substation. Everything looks fine, but there's no power. It's like... like something's draining it. The murmur of voices grew louder, a wave of fear rippling through the crowd. Don't worry, the mayor said, his voice strained. We'll get it fixed. Just a temporary setback. But even as he spoke, his words felt hollow meaningless against the encroaching darkness. I glanced around at the faces in the crowd, their fear a palpable thing, their eyes reflecting the flickering flames of their candles. We were vulnerable, exposed, our usual sense of security shattered by the sudden absence of light. And I couldn't shake off the feeling that we weren't alone in the darkness, that something ancient, something hungry, had awakened its presence a cold, watchful shadow that lurked just beyond the reach of our flickering lights. The crowd dispersed slowly, their faces etched with worry, their footsteps echoing on the empty street. Elena and I headed home, the darkness pressing in around us. The night was filled with the sounds of crickets and owls, but they offered no comfort. Every rustle of leaves, every snap of a twig made me jump. Back at the house, we lit candles, the flickering flames casting long, dancing shadows on the walls. Elena tried to read, but her eyes kept darting up, scanning the darkened corners of the room. I knew she was just as uneasy as I was, despite her attempts to stay calm. Maybe it's a storm, she said, her voice a little shaky. A really bad one that knocked out the whole grid. I nodded, hoping she was right. But the nagging feeling... That cold certainty I'd felt at the substation lingered. This wasn't a storm. This was something else. We tried to eat dinner, but neither of us had much of an appetite. The food tasted bland, the usual warmth of our home replaced by a chilling unease. After cleaning up, I went out to the garage and dug out an old kerosene lamp. The soft, yellowish light it cast felt a little more comforting than the flickering candles. We sat in the living room, the silence broken only by the ticking of the grandfather clock in the corner and the occasional crackle of the fire in the hearth. Elena was trying to grade papers, but her hand kept shaking. 
I was fiddling with the broken radio, hoping to catch a news report, but all I got was static. Then the phone rang. The shrill sound sliced through the quiet, making us both jump. I reached for the phone, my hand trembling. It was Mrs. Gunderson, an elderly woman who lived a few houses down. Her voice was high-pitched, frantic. Lucas, thank God you're there. I just saw... I saw something outside my window. It was tall, dark. It was watching me. My heart sank. Frank's words echoed in my mind. There are things in this town, things most folks don't know about, things that like the dark. I tried to calm Mrs. Gunderson, telling her it was probably just a stray dog or a deer, but even as I spoke the words, I didn't believe them. After hanging up, I told Elena about Mrs. Gunderson's call. She looked pale, her eyes wide with fear. Maybe we should call the sheriff, she said. He'll think we're overreacting, I replied. It's just a power outage. People are jumpy, that's all. But even as I spoke, doubt gnawed at me. What if it wasn't just a power outage? What if there was something out there? Something that was taking advantage of the darkness? The rest of the night was a blur of anxious waiting. Every creak of the house, every rustle of leaves outside sent a jolt of fear through us. We huddled together on the couch, the kerosene lamp casting long, dancing shadows on the walls. I told myself it was just our imaginations, the darkness playing tricks on us. But the feeling of being watched, the sense that something was out there, lurking in the shadows, wouldn't go away. Then we heard the scratching at the back door. It started softly, a gentle rasping sound that could have been a branch against the wood. But it grew louder, more insistent, like claws dragging across the surface. Elena gripped my arm, her fingers digging into my flesh. We stared at the door, paralyzed by fear. The scratching stopped. A moment of silence. Then a heavy thud, as if something had thrown itself against the door. I got up, my legs shaking, and reached for the shotgun I kept behind the couch. Elena followed, her eyes wide with terror. We crept towards the back door, the floorboards creaking beneath our feet. I reached for the doorknob, my hand trembling. Elena placed a hand on my arm, her touch a silent plea. I took a deep breath, turned the knob, and flung the door open. The backyard was empty. The darkness stretched out before us, the trees swaying gently in the wind. There was no sign of whatever had been scratching at the door. But the fear remained, a cold, gnawing certainty that the darkness held something we couldn't see, something that was watching us, waiting. The next morning I couldn't shake the feeling of unease. Elena tried to brush it off, blaming the lack of sleep and the unsettling darkness but I knew it was more than that. Frank's words about things in this town that liked the dark played on repeat in my mind. I couldn't ignore the fear that had burrowed under my skin, the sense that something was off, wrong. Elena went to work. She was determined to maintain some sense of normalcy, and I spent the day going door to door, checking on neighbors, offering help with generators and flashlights. The town felt like a ghost town, the usual hum of activity replaced by an eerie stillness. People huddled in their homes, their faces drawn and pale, their voices hushed with a shared fear. More and more people reported strange occurrences the night before. Doors creaking open on their own, objects moving without explanation, whispers in the dark. I tried to offer logical explanations, the wind, drafts, overactive imaginations, but I didn't believe my own words. I found myself drawn to Frank's house, that old farmhouse on the edge of town. I needed answers. I needed someone who understood the darkness that seemed to be spreading through our town, choking the light. Frank was sitting on his porch, a worn rocking chair creaking rhythmically beneath him. He was staring out at the fields, his eyes clouded with a distant sadness. You were right, Frank, I said, my voice weary. Something's happening. People are seeing things, hearing things. The darkness. It's not natural. He looked at me, a flicker of knowing in his eyes. I tried to warn you, Lucas, but sometimes it's better not to know. I need to know, I said, my voice a strained plea. I need to understand. People are scared. Elena. 
She's scared. Frank sighed, his gaze returning to the distant horizon. This town, it has a secret, Lucas. A darkness that's been sleeping for a long time. But now, now it's awake. He told me about the burial ground, an ancient site hidden deep in the woods. It had been discovered a century ago during the town's founding. They'd found artifacts, strange symbols carved into stone, and a burial chamber filled with bones and whispers of forgotten rituals. Most of the townspeople had dismissed it as an old Indian burial ground, nothing to worry about. But a few, the ones who had been there, the ones who had seen the symbols, felt a chill, a sense of unease that lingered long after the site had been covered over, forgotten. Frank's grandfather had been one of those men. He had warned the others, told them to leave the site undisturbed, but his pleas had fallen on deaf ears. They had dug deeper, driven by greed and curiosity, and they had unleashed something they couldn't understand. There have been stories ever since, Frank said, his voice low, almost a murmur. Strange lights in the woods, people disappearing, whispers in the dark. But nothing like this. The power. It's feeding it, Lucas. The darkness is giving it strength. I struggled to believe him, to reconcile his story with my own logical understanding of the world. But the evidence was there. The power outage, the eerie silence, the strange occurrences, the fear that had gripped the town. It all pointed to something beyond my comprehension. Something that defied the laws of nature. Something that had been awakened from its long slumber. And as I sat there, listening to Frank's tales of the town's dark past, a terrifying realization dawned on me. The power outage wasn't just a random event, a technical malfunction. It was a catalyst, a trigger that had unleashed an ancient, malevolent force, a darkness that had been waiting for its moment, a hunger that would consume everything in its path. The drive back to town was a blur, my mind a tangled mess of fear and disbelief. Frank's story, the burial ground, the darkness that had been unleashed. It all felt too unreal, like something out of a horror movie. And yet, the evidence was there. The power outage, the strange occurrences, the growing panic in the town. It was all too real. When I got home, Elena was waiting for me on the porch, her face etched with worry. She'd heard about the strange things happening in town, the whispers of something dark and dangerous lurking in the shadows. I told her everything, Frank's story, my own growing fears, the unsettling feeling that something was terribly wrong. She listened patiently, her hand resting on mine, her touch a grounding presence in the growing chaos. I don't understand, she said, her voice shaky. What are we supposed to do? I didn't have an answer. I was an electrician, a man of logic and reason, not a ghost hunter. I'd always believed in the tangible, the things I could see and touch. But now, in the suffocating darkness, my certainty had crumbled. The days that followed were a blur of fear and frustration. The power outage dragged on, each hour deepening the town's unease. People were on edge, their nerves frayed, their faces drawn and pale. The entity, whatever it was, seemed to be growing bolder. It played with us, toying with our sanity, pushing us to the brink of madness. Doors creaked open on their own, objects moved without explanation. Shadows danced in the flickering candlelight. Whispers slithered through the darkness. Our home, once a haven, a place of warmth and laughter, felt cold, invaded. The air was thick with an unseen presence, a feeling of being watched, judged. I found myself constantly looking over my shoulder, scanning the darkened corners of the rooms, searching for a glimpse of whatever lurked in the shadows. Elena, a skeptic by nature, tried to rationalize it all, to find logical explanations for the strange occurrences. But the fear was there, in her eyes, in her voice, a constant tremor beneath her forced calmness. I tried everything I could to restore the power, to bring back the light that seemed to hold the darkness at bay. I spent hours at the substation, checking every connection, every piece of equipment, but it was no use. 
the power was gone, drained, consumed. And with each passing hour, the entity's presence grew stronger, its grip on the town tightening, its influence seeping into our minds, our dreams. I started having nightmares, vivid, terrifying dreams of being chased through the dark woods, the entity's breath hot on my neck, its claws scraping at my back. I'd wake up in a cold sweat, my heart pounding, the feeling of its presence lingering, even in the supposed safety of our bedroom. One night, as we lay in bed, the darkness pressing in on us, a cold hand touched my cheek. I jolted upright, my heart hammering in my chest. Elena was beside me, sound asleep. Did you touch me? I asked, my voice a shaky whisper. She murmured something in her sleep. Her body curled away from me, and I realized it wasn't her hand. Something else had touched me, something cold, something not human. The realization sent a wave of terror through me, a visceral understanding that we were not alone, that something was in the house with us, something that thrived in the darkness, something that was watching, waiting. I got out of bed and crept to the window, peering out into the night. The moon was hidden behind thick clouds, the stars obscured, the world a canvas of black. I strained my eyes, searching for a glimpse of movement, a sign of whatever lurked in the shadows. But there was nothing, just the darkness pressing in on me, a suffocating presence that filled the room, the house, the entire town. The days blurred together, marked only by the rising and setting of the sun. The darkness held us captive, the entity's presence a constant weight, a suffocating dread that seeped into every corner of our lives. The town was on edge. People whispered about the strange occurrences, the growing sense of unease, the fear that something wicked had taken root in their midst. The usual rhythm of life had been disrupted, replaced by a tense, anxious waiting. Elena and I barely slept. Every creak of the house, every rustle of leaves outside, sent a jolt of fear through us. We huddled together in the flickering lamplight, shadows dancing on the walls, our whispers barely audible above the pounding of our hearts. I tried to maintain some semblance of order, to be the voice of reason, the anchor in the storm. I helped neighbors set up generators, distributed flashlights and batteries, offered reassurances that the power would be back soon. But even as I spoke the words, I felt the hollowness, the lie. The entity was growing stronger, its grip on the town tightening. It was no longer content with whispers and shadows. It was manifesting now, taking shape in the darkness, tormenting us with glimpses of our deepest fears. One afternoon, as I was helping Mrs. Gunderson fix her generator, I saw it. It wasn't a clear image, more a flicker of movement in the periphery of my vision, a tall, shadowy figure that seemed to melt into the trees as I turned to look. That night, Elena woke me up, her voice trembling. She'd seen it too, a dark shape standing in the doorway of our bedroom, its eyes glowing red in the darkness. It's here, Lucas, she said, her voice barely a whisper. It's in the house. I held her close, trying to calm her, telling her it was just a nightmare, but I didn't believe my own words. The entity was real, and it was closer than ever. I knew we couldn't stay in the house any longer. It wasn't safe. We packed a few essentials, blankets, food, water, the shotgun, and drove to Frank's farmhouse. The old man greeted us at the door, a kerosene lamp casting a dim glow on his weathered face. He didn't seem surprised to see us. I knew you'd come, he said, his voice a raspy whisper. The darkness has a way of bringing folks together. We huddled around the fire in Frank's living room, the flames offering a meager sense of warmth and security. The old man told us more about the burial ground, about the entity that had been awakened. It feeds on fear, Lucas, he said, his eyes fixed on the dancing flames. The more we fear it, the stronger it becomes. But what can we do? Elena asked, her voice laced with desperation. We can't just hide in here forever. Frank nodded slowly. We have to fight it, Elena. We have to face it. He told us about a ritual, 
an ancient ceremony that his grandfather had learned from the native people who had lived on the land before the town was built. A ritual that could bind the entity, send it back to its slumber. It's a long shot, he said, his voice weary, but it's our only hope. He led us to his attic, a dusty space filled with the remnants of a life lived. Among the old trunks and forgotten heirlooms, he found a leather-bound book, its pages filled with faded ink and strange symbols. My grandfather's journal, he said, his voice trembling slightly. He wrote down everything he knew about the burial ground, about the ritual. We spent the next few days studying the journal, deciphering its cryptic language, gathering the necessary materials for the ritual. It was a strange mix of ancient lore and modern technology, copper wire, candles, herbs, a small generator. Frank was our guide. His knowledge of the town's history and the entity's nature our only weapon. He was a reluctant hero, his body frail, his voice weary, but his eyes held a determination, a steely resolve to protect his town, his home. As we prepared for the ritual, a plan forming in our minds, I couldn't shake off the feeling of dread, the knowledge that we were walking into the heart of darkness, facing an ancient, powerful force that thrived on our fear. But there was no other choice. The entity had to be stopped, or it would consume everything we held dear. The air hung heavy in the forest, thick with the scent of pine and damp earth, but underneath it all, a metallic tang, like blood on cold steel. We moved through the trees, our flashlights cutting weak beams through the suffocating darkness. The old burial ground, the source of the town's curse, lay somewhere ahead, shrouded in shadow and secrets. Frank led the way, clutching his grandfather's journal, the pages rustling in the stillness. Elena was beside me, her hand gripping mine, her warmth a fragile comfort against the encroaching cold. I carried the shotgun, its weight a reassuring presence, though I knew it was likely useless against whatever lurked in these woods. It's close, Frank said, his voice a strained whisper. I can feel it. He pointed to a clearing ahead, the moonlight filtering through the trees, casting an eerie glow on a circle of standing stones. The air grew colder as we approached, a chill that seemed to seep into our bones, a warning that we were entering a place of power, a place of darkness. We set up the generator in the center of the stone circle, the hum of its engine a jarring intrusion in the ancient silence. Frank spread the copper wire on the ground, forming a complex pattern based on the symbols in his grandfather's journal. We placed the candles at the points of the pattern, their flames flickering in the night breeze, casting long dancing shadows on the ancient stones. Elena helped me pour the herbs into a small metal bowl, the scent strong, earthy, a mixture of sage and something else, something ancient and unfamiliar. Frank lit the herbs, the smoke rising in a thin, spiraling column, a beacon in the darkness. It's coming, he said, his voice a low growl. Be ready. The darkness seemed to shift around us, the air thickening, the temperature plummeting. The trees swayed, though there was no wind, their branches scraping against each other, a symphony of unsettling sounds. And then it was there, a presence, a weight, a cold darkness that pressed down on us, suffocating us. I couldn't see it, not clearly, but I felt it, a malevolent force that seemed to seep into my very being, a chill that froze my blood. The candles flickered, their flames dancing wildly. The generator sputtered, its engine straining, the lights dimming. Elena gasped, her hand tightening on mine. It's trying to break through, Frank said, his voice strained. We have to hold it, he began chanting, his voice a low, guttural sound that seemed to vibrate the very air around us. Elena joined in, her voice hesitant at first, then growing stronger, the words ancient, powerful, a language that echoed through the centuries. I raised the shotgun, aiming it into the darkness, but I didn't know what I was shooting at. The entity was everywhere and nowhere, a swirling mass of shadows and fear. The air crackled with energy the ground beneath our feet trembling. The generator died, plunging us into darkness, 
the candles our only source of light, their flames now a desperate, flickering defense against the encroaching shadows. The entity attacked. It wasn't a physical attack, not in the traditional sense. It was something more insidious, more terrifying. It played with our minds, twisting our perceptions, preying on our deepest fears. I saw shadows move, heard whispers in the darkness, felt claws scrape at my back. Elena screamed, her voice filled with terror, her eyes wide with a madness that mirrored my own. Frank's chanting faltered, his voice weak, his body trembling. The candles sputtered one by one, their flames dying out, leaving us exposed, vulnerable, drowning in the darkness. And then, just as I thought we were lost, Frank let out a final, desperate cry. The air shimmered, the ground shook, and a blinding light erupted from the center of the stone circle. The entity screamed, a sound that seemed to tear at the very fabric of reality, a primal, agonizing wail that echoed through the forest, through the town, through the very night itself. The light faded, leaving behind a ringing silence. I lay there, sprawled on the cold earth, my ears ringing, my vision blurry. The scent of burnt herbs lingered in the air, a strange, bitter smell that mingled with the metallic tang of blood. Elena was beside me, her eyes closed, her chest rising and falling in a shallow rhythm. I reached out, my hand trembling and touched her cheek. Her skin was cold, but she was alive. Frank lay motionless a few feet away, his face pale, his eyes staring vacantly up at the night sky. I crawled over to him, my heart sinking with each inch. His hand was cold, his pulse a faint fluttering thread that faded away beneath my fingertips. He was gone. Grief, raw and consuming, threatened to drown me. Frank, the old man who'd tried to warn us, who'd fought with us, who'd given his life to protect our town. He was gone, and the entity, the darkness that had taken him, was still out there, lurking somewhere in the shadows. I knew what I had to do. I lifted Frank's frail body into my arms and carried him back to the truck. Elena followed, her face blank, her eyes hollow, the shock of the night's events still holding her captive. We drove back to town in silence, the headlights cutting through the pre-dawn darkness, a pale, fragile barrier against the unseen forces that surrounded us. As we reached the edge of town, the first faint rays of sunlight began to break through the trees. And at that moment, a flicker of life returned to the streetlights, a pale, hesitant glow that spread through the town like a wave. The hum of electricity, the sound of normalcy, filled the air, a symphony of relief. The entity was gone, driven back to its slumber by the returning light. We buried Frank the next day, a small, somber gathering of townsfolk, their faces etched with grief and a lingering fear. The power was back on, life was resuming its usual rhythm, but something had changed. The town, once a place of quiet certainty, now felt fragile, vulnerable. The darkness was still out there, lurking in the woods, waiting for its moment. I stayed on, fixing the town's electrical grid, making sure the lights stayed on, a silent guardian against the shadows. Elena returned to teaching, her students a welcome distraction from the lingering unease. We tried to move on, to rebuild our lives, but the memory of that night in the woods, the weight of Frank's sacrifice haunted us. We knew the truth now, a truth that most of the town would never understand, a truth that we carried within us, a heavy burden of knowledge and fear. And as I stand here now, years later, watching the sunset paint the sky in shades of orange and purple. I can't shake the feeling that it's not over. The darkness is still out there, waiting, watching, and one day, when the lights go out again, it will return. <laughs>